Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Chaps, and I'm joined by Dr. Priscilla. Good morning. We just want to say thank you so much for joining us here at Cathedral of Praise yes. Online. We are so glad to see you today. Yes, and I am excited to be here yeah. as well. And we are in for a treat. Have you ever wondered if we're living in the last days? Would you like to know what are the clear signs of the times? And will the rapture happen in our lifetime? Well, guess what? Today, Dr. Foster is going to answer these questions and many more as our series, Journey Through the Bible, turns towards the parables of Jesus today. I'm excited. I am thrilled about this <laughs> yes, today. I, love I hope parables. you guys are ready and excited for the word as well. I hope that you have your family gathered around. Make sure everybody's with you so that we can all enjoy the worship and the word of this morning. God is going to be here. And he's going to be Amen. wherever you are as well. So whatever you need, bring it before the Lord, and he can meet all of our needs. Amen? Amen. I am thrilled to be here. And once again, we wanted to say thank you for joining us online. To be a part of our online community and part of our cathedral family, you are important, and we care about you guys. So yes. we want to say thank you for joining us. And if you wouldn't mind doing us a little bit of a favor, uh, you can find us on YouTube. So if you want to watch us on YouTube or be aware of anything that we're posting on there, go ahead and subscribe to us. You can find us with Cathedral of Praise Cordova. Make sure that you're following us on our Facebook page as well so that you yes. can get all of our awesome content dur during the week. Yes. Dr. Foster does his Wednesday Night Live. Yes. And those are an awesome time where you can be built up in the Lord as well. But today, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited. She's excited to be here. I am. We are excited to have you guys here as well. And we want to say, hey, service is about to get started. So like I said, get everybody together. Grab your notebook. Grab your Bible. Let's go before the Lord. We'll see you guys in a few minutes. Every one of you, those of you as well, just join me this morning as we lift up our voices to the King of Glory, the Lord God Almighty. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our King. Have a say, Jesus, we worship you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Whoa. Everybody just clap your hands and sing, whoa, 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 behold it comes, oh. everybody sing, everybody sing, and the trumpets call. Declaring the word of the Lord, oh yeah. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And these are the days of the harvest, say the fields are wise in the world, yeah. And we are the laborers in your vineyards of flesh. Elijah. 
center, declaring the word of the Lord. Oh yeah, and these are the days of the servant Moses. Righteousness been restored. How many of y'all know that there's nobody like the Lord? I said that there's nobody like the Lord. Oh God, there's no God like our King. Oh, somebody ever say now, say, there's no God like Jehovah. Lift your voice and say, there's no God like our God. There's no God like your God. There's no God like your Savior. There's no God like Him. There's no God like Jehovah. Nobody like Him. There's no God like Jehovah. Not in the east, not in the west, not in the north, not in the south. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like There's no God like Jehovah. Oh, there's no God like Jehovah. Whoa, 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 whoa. There's no God like Jehovah. No God like There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Worship in this place. There's no God like you. There's no God like you. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Put your hands together, everybody. Come on, clap your hands. Clap your hands, Mr. Lord G. Clap your hands, Mr. Lord G. Say God's been good to you. Come on, clap your hands. Say God's been good to you. Come on, clap your hands. I've been made your way when you're strong. Say, come on, clap your hands. I've been open the way for you, yeah. Say, come on, clap 
you ain't. There's no God like there's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. No God like There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Good morning. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise in this place today. We serve a great, big, awesome, mighty God, and He is with us this morning. It's so good to have each and every one of you here today. It's also good to have everyone joining us online from Facebook Live to YouTube Live. Come on, let's give them all a big God bless you. Thousands of people joining us all over the world. Thank you for being with us today. You know, God has a word in season for us in this place. Do you believe that? Well, you know, we're in this series titled Journey Through the Bible. It's week number 34. We're studying our way from Genesis all the way through to the maps. We just wrapped up last week studying the major miracles of Jesus. Now we're going to step into the major parables of Jesus. Now the word parable, uh, it comes from two Greek words, para. Para means to come alongside. We use the word in English. Think about a para pro, not a teacher, but one who comes alongside of a teacher. Paralegal, not an attorney, but one who comes alongside an attorney, right? So para, one who comes alongside or something that comes alongside. Now, um, the word bole, which is it, we, where we get the word bull, right? The word bole means a story or an illustration that is thrown. So if you're throwing an illustration or you're throwing a story at someone, um, then that's what bole means in the Greek. When you combine them, it literally means a story that is thrown alongside of doctrine or teaching or principle to further understand it. Simply put, a parable is a timely story with a timeless truth. A timely story with a timeless truth. Let's dive in today. We're going to take a look at the, the Gospel of Matthew chapter number 25 and beginning with verse number one. Matthew chapter 25, verse number one. Then, everybody say then. then. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Now, chapter 25 starts out with the word 
then. And how many of you know we interpret the Bible with the Bible, right? If you want, if you're taking notes, if you want to understand the context of the Bible, you need to understand the, the if you want to understand the content rather of the Bible, you need to understand the content of the Bible, the context. If you want to understand the context, you'll never understand it until you understand the content. So we, that means then, when is then? We have to go back to chapter 24 to understand when is then. Chapter 24, verse number 1, Jesus was leaving the temple grounds with his disciples and pointed out to them the various temple buildings. But he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, that they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. All right, so th- th- you have to understand the first century temple was an expansive edifice, all right? Tons and tons of stones all over the complex. And what Jesus was saying at the time seemed completely illogical, completely implausible. There's no way, surely Jesus was speaking hyperbolically. There's no way that literally every one of those stones would be separated from the other stones. Well, in 70 AD, Rome invades Jerusalem, lights the city on fire. With it, the great heat consumed the mighty temple and the temple complex. All of the gold that was laced within the temple walls melted down into the cracks between the stones. So after the fire subsided and cooled off, the emperor gave the order to the locals to separate every stone from the other stone in order to extract the gold. Jesus was not speaking hyperbolically. What Jesus said came true in its most literal sense. That's the setup for everything else Jesus says in chapter 24. In other words, when we read something, and you may think to yourself, there's no way that's going to happen. Remember what happened in 70 AD. God is, Jesus has already proved. Look, I, I'm, I'm not speaking figuratively here. I'm not speaking hyperbolically. Literally what I'm saying is going to come true. Now let's continue uh, as we take a look at verse number 3. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him, verse number 3. They came to him privately and said, Tell us when all of this will happen. What sign will signal your return and the end of the world. What sign they asked for. Verse number four, Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming that I am the Messiah and they will deceive many. Now I did a little bit of research this week and I found that In the 18th century, there were two people who claimed to be the Messiah. In the 19th century, there were seven people who claimed to be the Messiah. In the 20th century, there were 29 people who claimed to be the the Messiah. And so what we're seeing with each passing century, more and more people are claiming to be the Messiah and more and more people are legitimately following them. Here's the thing we have to remember about deception. It's deceiving. (laughs) People are following these people who are claiming to be the Messiah. Ultimately, the biggest one, the biggest deception, the biggest mockery will take place in the life of who the Bible calls the Antichrist. This is a, a geopolitical figure that will assume world domination and world influence. We're not going to talk about him today. We'll talk about him as we get toward the book of Revelation. But understand, this is happening right now. And thousands upon thousands of people are being misled. Here's what I want you to do. As we go through, I'm I'm going to give you what Jesus said long ago. And and I want you, in fact, if you're taking notes, you can even formulate your own little checkbox. And I want you, if you think that we're today living in the time that Jesus described 
mentally or physically. I want you to put a check by that aspect of it. You can even put a check in your Bible if you have your Bible open. Do I think that this is coming true today? It's up to you. I'm going to present the evidence. You draw your own conclusions. And so we're going to go through this together, all right? So um, what we see is that with each passing century, more and more people are doing what Jesus said would happen. Take a look at verse number 6. It says, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars. But don't panic. Somebody say, don't panic. Don't panic, don't panic Jesus said, because these things must take place by the end, or these, they must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. And so the key word in that passage is don't panic. Now, it's up to you. Uh, in your mind, do you place a check next to that as we've gone through a century? We, in fact, we have a, a war right now that is the longest running war in American history, the Afghan war. And so in your mind, are there wars and rumors of wars now more than ever? You just make up your mind and, and see what you think. Take a look at verse number 7. It says, nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. Now, I want to key in on something that you may not think is an escalating reality in America, and that is famines. You know, uh, I, I, when we live, as we sit here in America, we're going to leave this place, and uh, the chances are when you leave, you're going to have something to eat. Uh, and, and so when we hear that in the last days, there will be these great famines. We may not perceive that it is uh, an, an ever-present reality or an escalating reality for the world. But here's what you should know. This year, 2020, according to multiple sources, over 9 million people will die from hunger or hunger-related issues. To put that into perspective, that's 2.4. 4 million more people than live in the entire state of Tennessee. Now, COVID has crushed us all. It, it, it has affected every aspect of the world. Globally, 1.2 million people have died, and each death is a tragic death. But my question is, if you're going to discount what Jesus said there and say it's not applying to us, what you're saying is, is that the deaths of the 9 million are somehow less important than the deaths of the 1.2 million. Every death is, is tragic. But what I want you to see is this is absolutely an escalating a reality for the world. There are famines all over the world. We're so blessed to live in the United States. I'm not sure if you have the privilege of traveling outside of our gracious and, and beautiful borders, but if you ever do, you'll see very quickly how blessed we are to live in the United States of America. If you're glad that God has put you here, come on, we ought to give him some praise right now. He's been gracious to us. But don't think for a moment that just because a famine is not an escalating reality to you, that it's not an escalating reality in the world. So would you place a check mark next to famine you choose? Take a look at verse number 8. Verse number 8 says, But all this is only the first of the birth pains, with more to come. Then you will be arrested and persecuted and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. Now, according to the Center of the Study of Global Christianity from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, this year, over 100,000 people will die simply because they confess their love for Jesus Christ. 100,000. To put that into a local context, that would fill up the Liberty Bowl Memorial Stadium where the Tigers play two times. One 100,000 people will die just because they love Jesus. So in your mind, does that check the mark? Or does it have to get up to 200,000 or 300,000? What checks the mark in your mind? Take a look at verse number 10. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Can I just say, 
that I've never seen a time, even here in America, uh, where people are hated more just for possessing a varying opinion on a given topic. Can I get a witness? Jesus said we should love our neighbor. Okay, I'm going to come back and hit that later. <clears throat> Verse 11, many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Verse 12, sin will be rampant everywhere and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. Now, according to Barna Research, just one in, in 2020, just one in every four Americans are practicing Christians. Now, when you compare that to the same survey taken 20 years ago, in the year 2020, at that time, 50% of Americans claim to be a practicing Christian. Now, it has decreased by half. What did Jesus say? The love of many will grow cold. Many will walk away from me. Take a look at verse 13. It says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Somebody say, that's me. That's me. If you endure to the end, you will be saved. Verse 14, the good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all the nations will hear it. And then the end will come. Now, within the past six weeks, I preached in Pakistan twice via satellite. I want to show you some pictures here on the screen that were taken from the groups of people that we preached to there in Pakistan. Oh, it's, it, it is an amazing sight to see via satellite, we're preaching the gospel into a, a nation that is closed to the gospel. Into a nation that, if I were to go there today and preach live an open air crusade, all the attention and all the aspects that would surround that, they would arrest me and kill me in prison. But yet, through the miracle of technology, we can go there and preach the good news to people at the very ends of the earth. What did Jesus say? When the gospel of this kingdom is preached in all of the earth, then the end will come. So you tell me, do you think we're living in the end of times? Does that check some or all of the marks? Several years ago, my family and I took a trip from... Georgia to LA. It was it was this long, incredible, smelly road trip. Amen. It was amazing. It was brutal. It's, it's a word I made up called like half brut, brutal, half beautiful, right? Um, and, and so I mean, it was it was brutal. But there was there was a sign that we saw on I forty in New Mexico, an astonishing sign. The sign said Los Angeles. 1,043 miles. Well, we're in the middle of nowhere, several states away. My goodness, why would I even need to know? That was the most discouraging thing I had seen all that trip. Do we really have another 1,000 miles to go? Like, nobody needed to see that. Just leave me alone. Ignorance is bliss. But as we made the turn... And hopped on to I-5 and headed north along that route. We begin to see more signs for L.A. And more signs. And before too long, it wasn't just signs about distance. It was signs about activity. Things to do. Places to eat. Places to go. My point is, the closer we got to Los Angeles, the more signs we saw. The closer we get to the end, the more signs we will see. Now, that describes the wind. Let's go back to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, verse number 1. Then, when is then? Then is now. 
We've answered the question of when is then. Then is right now. This is a parable that is not for someone in the first century Jewish world. This is a parable for everyone who is alive in the year 2020. Then is now. Context is key. You'll never understand the content until you understand the context. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Verse number two. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. I cannot read verse number three without hearing the voice of Mr. T in my head. Come on, y'all, to help me this morning. I pity the fool they ain't got enough oil in their lamp. I mean, I just, it's just like an 80s thing. Are you with me, huh? I ain't getting on no plane, Hannibal, right? I mean, it's just, I can't get it out of my head. I pity the fool ain't got enough oil in his lamp. The foolish ones did not take enough olive oil for their lamps. The lamps that Jesus was describing was a handheld little jar of clay. The jar of clay was then filled with olive oil with a wick, and that's what was used as a lamp. It was a handheld jar of clay that you would light. How many know the Bible says that we have this treasure, speaking of the presence of the Holy Spirit in earthen vessels of clay. This whole thing is about to come alive to you in such a real way. Verse number four says the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Now let me break it down like Bobby Brown. So this story... It's just, again, it's just filled with all these different aspects. We see that Jesus is the groom. Everybody with me? Tracking with me? Jesus is the groom. If you're a believer, then you are a bridesmaid. The church collectively is the bride. So individually, as believers, we're bridesmaid. But when we come together, we are the bride. This parable is set apart from every other parable that Jesus spoke because it wasn't about someone in the first century. It's about someone in this century, in the 21st century. It's about you. You find yourself being described by the very lips of Jesus. You are that jar of clay. And our, the question today is, are you wise or are you foolish the oil represents the holy spirit of god the groom is coming to, to G, who is jesus to rapture the church or to take the bride away now when the groom was delayed in other words it took longer than the bridesmaids thought it would take how many of you know it's taken longer than us as believers thought it would take. I mean, I used to remember praying, oh, Jesus, please don't come until I get married. Come on, y'all don't leave me hanging today. Come on. Real talk. And um, uh, we, we all have been there. We've heard messages. And it has taken longer, if we're honest, it has taken longer than we thought it would take. So what happens to the church when it takes longer than we think it should take the church falls asleep the bridesmaids those who are waiting for the groom fall asleep notice those who were browsy, who were drowsy were not just the wise virgins but the the foolish ones as well they were all drowsy oh i believe all the church can become drowsy if we're not careful. We can all think that surely the Lord's going to come to another generation. Surely he's not coming soon. And we would make the mistake that those who were foolish 
in this story made. Take a look at verse number 6. It says, At midnight they were roused by the shouts. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out to meet him. Now there's some things that you need to know about the Jewish wedding 2,000 years ago. Um, first of all, a groom would go, would leave his father's house, and he would go to the house of the bride to negotiate what was called a bride price. The groom would pay for the privilege of marrying the daughter. As a father of one daughter, I think that's a great idea. As a father of two sons, I'm glad we don't do it anymore. Amen. Matthew, we remember, was speaking primarily to Jews. That's why he didn't explain any of this. They all understood. What did Jesus do? He left his home in heaven. He came to the home of the bride. And he paid a very expensive bride price with his own blood. He paid the right. He paid for the price of the bride. Next, the groom would return to his father's house to build a dwelling for the new bride and he to live in. Take a look at John chapter 4, verse 2. 14, verse 2, rather. It says, Jesus speaking here, he says, There is more than enough room in my father's home. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. Verse number three, he says, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be where I am. Now, the groom does not know when the add-on, when the addition to his father's house is complete. It is up to the father and his standards to decide when the home is complete. How many of you know that if it were left up to the anxious groom, Come on, somebody. Oh, back in the day, they would just throw up a couple of posts, put a canvas up for a roof, a little pallet for the bed, put on Barry White and call it a day. It wasn't up to the groom. It was up to the father. What did Jesus say? Even the son does not know the day or the hour. Only the father knows. I hope you see this coming alive before your very eyes. Now, the groom normally returned to get his bride around midnight. Uh, the groom would often come, it's described other places, like a thief in the night. You know how a thief comes to your house when you least expect it? If you expected a thief coming... How many of you know it wouldn't be a, a robbery, it would be an ambush? Come on, somebody. A thief in the night means that you're not expecting. It happens when you least expect it. Tradition, they would often come at or around midnight. It was, it was all about the suspense of the coming. And as the groom would begin to make his way down the streets, the groom's men would run out in front of the, the groom and broadcast, Behold, the bride's groom is coming. And they would blast a trumpet. They would say, Behold, the bride's groom is coming. And they would blast a trumpet. Go with me now to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 16, and see if this sounds a little bit familiar. For the Lord himself will come down with a commanding shout, with the voice of an archangel. I don't know, but I suspect that the voice of the archangel will be saying, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. With a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. Are you seeing this? It goes on to say that First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Verse 17, then together with them, 
We who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up. That word, that phrase, caught up in the, in the Greek, it's rapturo. Think about like a, a major um, a bird of prey snatching a snake or a fish from the water. In other words, it happens quickly. It happens unexpectedly. That, that phrase, caught up in the Greek, is where we get the word rapture. You're not going to find the word rapture in your Bible, so don't go looking for it. It comes from this phrase, caught up, which means rapturo. It says that we, we who are alive and remain, will be caught up, rapturoed taken like a bird of prey takes a fish out of nowhere the bible says jesus said two will be walking down the road one will be taken the other left behind two will be grinding at the mill one will be taken the other left behind two will be lying in bed one will be taken the other left behind rapture will happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye so then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be rapturoed into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now after the groom takes the bride, there is a seven-day festival called the marriage feast. Well, if you come up, I, I'm one who believes the Bible describes a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, if you're one that, that believes the Bible describes a mid-tribulation rapture, I'm not going to argue with you. Both camps tend to speak in cyclical terms. We could spend hours negotiating the ins and outs of those perspectives, but at the end of the day, our job is not to, uh, our job is simply to be ready, right? We need to be ready and to get as many people ready as we possibly can. That's our job. Not to argue over whether we think it's mid or post or this or that. No, no, no. We just should be ready. And so it's my belief, however, that the Bible describes a pre-tribulation rapture. In other words, the rapture takes place. The Lord comes to get his bride and we go to heaven where we will partake in what the Bible calls the marriage supper of the Lamb, while things are going downhill on earth in a rapid fashion. We're not going to talk about that today. We'll talk about it in another session. But take a look, if you will, uh, back to the parable. So the groom is coming to get the bride, which is the church. Look at verse number 7. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the foolish, the five foolish ones... A beautiful, right? The five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. Remember, oil is indicative or representative of the Holy Spirit of God, the presence of God in our life. How many of you know that you cannot borrow someone else's love for Jesus? You cannot borrow someone else's relationship with God. You cannot borrow someone else's presence of God that is with them. Verse 9, the others replied, we don't have enough for us and you. Go to a shop and buy some for yourself. They're like, look, Walmart is open 24 hours a day. You can go out and buy it yourself. Verse 10. But while they were gone, somebody say, while they were gone. The bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was locked. After the church is raptured, there will not be a second trip. I've jumped out of a couple of airplanes, both with parachutes. <clears throat> but there has been at least one occasion when a videographer leaped out of a plane 
and his buddy system failed. The buddy system that said, do the dummy check that says everything looks good on you. He was hiding toward the back of the plane and none of his friends noticed that he actually did not have his parachute on. He jumped out videoing what would ultimately be his own death. Once he jumped out, nothing could be done. You say, but it's taken Jesus so long. There's a true story about a young woman who was asked out on a date. She said yes. She prepared all week long for that date. She had her nails did, her hair was done. Everything was perfect. She had her best high heel shoes on. Six o'clock came, he didn't show. Seven o'clock came, he didn't show. Eight o'clock, he didn't show. Nine o'clock, the doorbell rings. By then, she had on her sweats. She'd taken off her makeup. And she answers the door, and there he is, three hours late. And he said to her, I'm three hours late. I can't believe you're still not ready. <laughs> true story the only difference is as we wait for Jesus we're not waiting for a date we're waiting for a deliverer are you ready are you ready are you making sure that everyone you know and love is ready that's the job of the church in the last days we are to be ready, and we need to go around to everyone saying, you got some oil, you need some oil. You need to get in the presence of God. You need to come to church with me. You need to, come on, I'm just going to pick you up. You can get in my car. I'm going to bring you to church. You're going to get some oil in your life. You're going to feel the presence of God forgive you, wash you, cleanse you, baptize you. Because Jesus is coming soon. The job of the church is to stay in a perpetual state of readiness. Are you ready? Look at verse 11. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back to them, believe me, I don't know you. What's shocking about this story that Jesus told that was about the year 2020 is that all of the bridesmaids had the lamp. In other words, from the outside, they looked like they were great Christians. They, all, they were all in the party. But according to Jesus, 50% of them, one half, we're not ready when the groom returned. Here they are on the outside of the wedding feast door knocking. What did, what did the groom or Jesus say in this instance? I don't know you. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. You can't borrow someone else's relationship with Jesus. You need to fall in love with Jesus today. You need to have the oil in your life today. You need to be ready today. Then Jesus said, verse 13, and th this words, the words that Jesus said, he was not saying to his disciples. He was not saying to someone in the year, in, in the year uh, 33 AD or thereabout, he was saying this to those of us in 2020 and beyond should the Lord tarry. So you too must keep watch for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. One half of those who were associated with the wedding party, with the church, were not ready. Are you ready? Stand with me if you will. Gracious Father, we humble ourselves before you. Lord, it's not about worthiness because none of us 
are worthy. It's about rather readiness. So, Father, I pray that you would awaken the church. I pray you would awaken this church. Lord, pull us out of the drowsy state that the global church finds herself in today. Pull us out. Awaken us with mission. Awaken us with divine purpose. Awaken us with a sharpness and with an agility and a focus that you are coming soon. And not only are we going to be ready, but we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that others around us in the city of Memphis are ready in Jesus' name. Father, put an awakening on the church worldwide. As we have been lulled to sleep by luxury, we, we've been uh, saying the lullaby of the world. Wake us up, Lord. Make us alert. And make us ready. Holy Spirit, we invite your oil. We don't just need enough oil for today, Lord. We need, we need some extra oil. We need some extra. We need to be ready. Make us ready, Lord. As you search our heart, make us ready. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name. First of all, if there's no one looking around, if you're here today, you say, I need the grace of God, I need to invite the oil of the Holy Spirit in. I may be one of those who is a part of the church but is not ready. And today I want to know that I am ready. Today I want to invite the oil of the Spirit to fill up this earthen vessel. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand right where you are. Just lift it up and say, Pastor, that's me. Pray with me. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. Just keep raising them and say, Pastor, that's me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want everyone to say this prayer with me right now. Say, Father, prepare my heart for your return. I humble myself. Forgive me. But fill me, Holy Spirit. Let there be an overflow in my life. So that I get oil on people just by them getting close. Flow through this house. Through my home. So that we will be ready. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. With no one moving, I want to put a second call out, and this is for all of us who claim to be the church. If you claim to be the church, then rescued people, rescue people. Saved people, save people. Reached people, reach people. If we truly believe what the Bible says, that Jesus is coming, and he'll remove the church for a great time of tribulation. If we really believe that, then we're going to be motivated every single day to tell everyone we know about how much Jesus loves them. To stand against the tide of a society that says, you sit down and shut up because you belong to Jesus. Let a holy boldness rise within his house. Rise within his people. If you're willing to join the army today to say, I want to be one who is rescued that rescues. I want to be someone who is saved that saved. If that's you, I want you to shoot your arm up in this place. All over this house, the balcony, come on, give glory to God. Lord, we thank you for a church that understands saved people, save people, rescued people, rescue people. Redeemed people help others get redeemed. So Lord, move through a mighty work. Move in passion within our hearts so that we ready every single person we can 
for the return of our Savior. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Come on, clap your hands and give the Lord some praise.
Well, thank you everybody for joining us. It was our pleasure to have you joining us here at Cathedral of Praise online. We're so glad that you were a part of our service today, wherever that you're joining us from. Man, that, that was a powerful time of being in God's presence and worship and the Lord this morning. Yes, it. it was. And I grew up with the, you know, my father talking about the parables. And today it really resonated with me what Dr. Foster said. Keep your lamps trimmed and ready because we don't know when, uh, you know, God is going to just come back and rapture the, the church, his bride. And so are you ready? That's your challenge for this week to just make sure that you are ready are spreading the word of God each and every day to everyone. Yeah, it's a responsibility for all of us to make sure that we're ready, and we look forward to that day, don't we? We do. We do. Well, I once again, so glad that you guys decided to join us for Cathedral of Praise online. It is our pleasure to be able to worship the Lord with our extended family online. If you are joining us for the first time online, or maybe it's your first time in a, in a little bit, if you would do us a real easy favor. If you would text the word CPVIP to the number 94000, that should be on your screen. That'll allow us to get a little bit of information from you about who you are and what you're interested in, and it'll allow us to give you some information about who we are as a church as well so that we can become better acquainted and more connected. So if you would do us that favor, once again, that number is 94000 and text the word CP. VIP. Yes, and it is not by any kind of coincidence or mis uh, or, or happenstance that you're here with us today, yeah, and so true. we are thankful to have you. And um, this is good ground. If you'd like to partner with us, here are some opportunities, some ways that you can. You can go to our website at cathedralofpraiseag.com, click on the giving bar, and then you will be guided to a secure site. Then secondly, you can text the word cathedral to the number 888-364-4483 on your screen, and then you will be guided to give as well. And then thirdly, you can mail in a check made out to cathedral to 8200 Macon Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38018. This is good ground. We're not just here in Cordova, but all over the world. Yes, we are so grateful for the faithful giving of all of our members yes. online and in person. The work of God is going forth because of your generosity. And so we want to say thank you. And to give you a little bit of insight into some of the stuff that we're partnering with here at Cathedral of Praise, check out this missions video from BGMC. We are thrilled to support the missions work of BGMC all around the world. And then stay tuned because we have a special welcome video from a new kids pastor. So check out these videos. We look forward to seeing you next week. Join us on Wednesday Night Live. Take care. We God love you guys. Bless you. Children for decades now have been dropping coins into the barrel and been making a huge difference in the kingdom of God around the world. BGMC Buddy has been teaching the youngest in our fellowship to live for something beyond themselves. This year alone, BGMC has taken the gospel to more than 30,000 children around the world. I've learned that when you sacrifice and you give, God blesses you. focused life are inspiring incredible generosity since 1949 over 160 million dollars has been raised and we are just getting started
Good morning, Cathedral of Praise. My name is Pastor Sam, and what you just saw was some of the super cool and exciting things we are going to be doing in Sea Kids. So mom and dad, boys and girls, get ready because on November the 29th, we're gonna be having our very first kids service. We're super excited and can't wait to meet and see all of you. 